from Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, and brought to you by Bet Online. This is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today from Cobra Kai and the Karate Kid, Martin Cove, and from the upcoming film Cage Fighter Worlds Collide, Chuck Liddell. With Bolt Bryan on Sound of X, Jeff Cesario with the sports, I fill in on news, and Dr. Drew stops by. And now, mercy is for the weak. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. It's just to get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sharing. Gina Grad is on a top secret project, so Dawson's going to do the news. Drew, huh. I asked to hang with us for a couple of reasons. I'll explain that in a second. First, good day, Ball Brian. What I do now. So <laughs> Dr. Drew is here as a couple of subjects. we got the, the president's health and reading uh, between the lines and sorting out some of the facts when it comes to some of the information that we've all yes. heard over the last couple of days. Drew does a very nice job of... Uh, adding a lot of clarity to that. Also, as we tape this, we just found out that Eddie Van Halen had passed away. Mm. And uh, Drew says he knows him a little better than he let on. Which, Fellow Pasadena native? He yes, is. And I've got I, a long history with Eddie. And also, so Drew grew up in Pasadena. Eddie at least played Pasadena. That was their circuit. I don't know if he grew, if he grew up in Pasadena or Monrovia or like around there. He, they're a Pasadena band, but right. it's all sort of that area. And played shows that you went to in high school and so things I, like that? So my, in La Cunada, my sons were gladiator football players, which is the junior all-American football. And we had a blood drive at the high school. Locking down high school, and I went in to give blood, and I was in the cafeteria lying there, and I'm looking at this kind of proscenium and a clock above the proscenium. I'm thinking I have been in this room before. This, you know, about ten years ago, and I had a complete like flashback to 1973. Somebody invited me to the prom at Locking Down High School, band playing on that stage, Van Halen. Well, this is very interesting because I know. Snotty Scotty and the Hankies yes. played your prom. <laughs> yes, they did. Who, look, some could argue were bigger than Van Halen. <laughs> At the others, time. others could make an argument for Van Halen. I don't want to get mired in that. We had. No, we, I mean, the, the history I will think show had, that Scotty, <laughs> Snotty Scotty and the Hankies sure. may have been a bigger band. Again, I don't, I'm not here to get mired in that argument. That'll, <laughs> that'll go on in perpetuity. But uh. I always knew that Drew's prom was Scotty Snotty. Snotty Scotty and, and, and the Hanky. Please, we have Blue's image. Too. Blue's image as well. <laughs> Rod, Captain yes. Rod, oh, upon your mystery, mystery ship. ship. So, I, but I also knew he saw Van Halen, but I was trying to put it in some sort of context because yep. I knew it wasn't his prom, but nope. you were invited to someone else's prom. To a Lock and Yala High School prom. So that was. And, uh, and I, and I, at the time, I. I, there was a Wurlitzer organ with this swirling speaker they had, and I've always and I and it was I didn't like it. It always bothered me, and, mm-hmm. and so apparently, looking at Van Halen history, they had an organ player for a while. Yeah. So that was the very early days of uh, David Lee Roth and Van no, Halen. No, David Lee Roth. That oh part. no, 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 no. He oh, came back for four years later. That's why they were playing proms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was right. pre David Lee Roth. Pre David Lee Roth. Interesting. Eddie Van Halen there, not David Lee Roth. Did you? He, could you tell he was a great guitar player? You could tell it was it could potentially be a great band. Yeah, you could tell there were musicians involved. Uh, you know, and they weren't playing pap for the crowd. Right, they were they were musicians. So, and, and he Eddie had a long history of alcoholism and smoking, mm-hmm. and so he got he died of head and neck cancer, which is that's how you get. He thinks he got it from holding a metal guitar pick in his mouth. Let me disavow that. Let me disabuse you of that notion. You get it from alcohol, tobacco, and HPV. Mm. So this is a chance to talk about HPV, too. Michael Douglas has this same cancer, and you can get a vaccine against this. So get the damn HPV vaccine, everybody. We're seeing a marked uptick in head and neck cancer in males because of HPV. And then if you oh, drink shit. and smoke on top of that, then you pretty much are going to get it. Well, when you say, when, your question for Drew on that subject. When yeah. you say head and neck cancer, is that... Brain cancer is a soft no, cancer. No, no, his his went to the brain. We're talking about really pharynx, larynx, tongue, the back oh. of the throat. And people wow. say people say throat cancer. We say head and neck because it descends into the neck and it goes up gotcha. into the head. You know, so I'll say this: 
I drink a little, I smoke a little, but I swore off eating pussy years ago. <laughs> I so know that you'll about be happy. You. I know that to know before that before HPV became a big problem. Yes, yes. I I was I was early to that yeah, you to were. that party. Yeah. So Eddie gone. Well, Eddie, it wasn't really a party. <laughs> Eddie seemed pretty complex and troubled and, and, in many and, but ways. But the nicest guy you really ever. Ever want to meet? Everybody will tell you that about him, and I'm here to tell you that's true. Really? Even even what? he would. <laughs> what, David would hold on. Say that? Sammy Hagar would say that. <laughs> well, but they he would have when he drank. You know, there's a lot of people I treated that when they drank they were not so cool, and so that's when people get they put off people is when they're no, I, and I, I know, I don't but hold the, that the, against them. I know, but the math is you know this guy was a monster when he drank, but if he drank all the time, then well, do, then you're in trouble. Do the math. Well, then right. you're in trouble. Yeah. So he was a great musician. I'll call him complex. Um, and you knew him a little more off the air than, than we'd ever really yeah. sort of talked about. Yeah. Is that that's, treating him? Yes, that's about all I'm comfortable saying. Okay. Yes. So but well, yeah, and, and I and I and Bob Forrest knew him pretty well, and I, I got to know him a little bit, and and uh, I, I just thought he was a great guy, great guy, and and a great musician. Well, definitely a great musician. And, and whatever, whenever I heard about conflicts and stuff, I'm thinking, eh, it's the alcoholism, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, look, look, the biggest example that I know of is Rodney King. Rodney King was the nicest human I've ever met, mm. except when he drank. And when he drank, well, it just, it was just turned him into a monster. Yeah. And uh, we've all been around a few of those people, good yeah. drunks, bad drunks. You had a drunks. guy that would run down the hall screaming. Remember that guy in Mexico or whatever it was? Yeah, Rudy. Rudy, yeah. Well, the, the problem is... I didn't really know about blackout drinking and how that affected certain people, where they would have a completely separate life. Well, then though their personality just complete, they're on drugs, and their personality completely changes. No, completely. but what what I'm saying is is capable of drinking to some point, where then later on in that night you could do incredible things mostly ho horrific things and then wake up the next day and it was i you know i i would think it in a way all those stories about uh the werewolf and yeah, yeah. uh the count dracula and no, stuff no, the one i think that was those were those were based on blackout drinking like <laughs> stop me before i turn into this thing and yeah, haunt the night the, the right. one that was actually consciously done on alcoholism was dr jekyll and mr hyde Oh, that right. was actually about alcoholism, right? So, and then the next day, you just wake up and your 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 clothes are tattered and you don't know what happened. Yep. Yes, Brian. I I've I've never thought about this before, but since we have the expert in the room, Drew is 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 the the good drunk bad drunk thing, the thing where you have some booze and become out of control or you black out or whatever it is. Is that an indicator of alcoholism? Is it correlated in any way? Blacking out is the how alcohol affects you is is not necessarily. I mean, it's people there are some people that are exquisitely sensitive to benzodiazepines and alcohol and would have sort of all kinds of personality and emotional changes with low levels of exposure. But blacking out suggests a certain kind of a relationship with alcohol that's not normal. If you black out more than a couple times, it's like, oh yeah, that's 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 this. A that's couple alcohol. times. Why yeah. is the bar so low? Yeah, <laughs> come on, Drew. Well, because because there's drinking games in college that make people black out. You know what I mean? Yo, people fuck, are not drinking a. on their own, and they're sort of forced to drink. Kind of thing. Drew Drew has a note in front of him. Uh, the note. I'm glad we'll uh, do a little love line episode here. But the uh, the note is from a young lady. And it was a note that I discovered. When you gave up on the uh, going down on ladies? <laughs> it was a she note. <laughs> wrote you a little dissertation about that? This was a what? note in a bottle. Oh. This was literally a note wow. in a bottle. This was a cry for help. And it was cast into the sea. Mm. You and found it on the beach? I Washed discovered it on the beach. That's, That's right. I Is discovered it. And, and when uh, she let it go, was she like in New Zealand or Bali or? It took, it took, I don't, it, I'll, I'll explain more. It took uh, needle nose pliers to extricate it from the bottle. Wow. And uh, the note in the bottle, which I found washed up on the beach about two weeks ago, reads this way. Go ahead, Drew. I want to just let go of who I was trying to make myself be. But reality is I am who I'm supposed to be. Nobody can stop me. I'm going to stop pleasing people. It's time to please myself. Fuck everybody who tries to take my energy when I'm full of energy. To whomever reads or finds this, 
Don't hold back. Your life is beautiful. You got this, Celine, with a heart. So there's also a phone number on it. So I told uh, Chris, why don't we call Celine? <laughs> Adam, your life is beautiful. <laughs> I know. And see Let go of it. And 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 see how this you know, works. Brian, Adam's such a people pleaser too. You know what I'm saying? He's tired. To stop that. Tired of pleasing. Right yeah, so I swore off eating pussy. I'm tired. Tired of trying to please people. Now I'm gonna blow myself. <laughs> Ruth, my... there's some sort of butterfly effect going on where, like, someone just down the beach was supposed to get that bottle, yeah. like, a really good, sweet, like, yeah. wholesome person, but oh, the wind Come on now. Down. Come on. <laughs> so, um, we'll talk. So, Chris contacted her and we'll talk to her. I'm curious. I'm, I want to know about this random life. Yeah. Also, um, how she's doing. Drew, I was talking to him about, he was sort of telling us the nuts and the bolts of the presidential. COVID situation yeah, and, yeah. and sort of how the news portrays it. So yeah. what are some of the things we could learn as lay people when we're watching the news and they're talking about medical things so of this? So whenever nature? you hear something reported medically, know that they don't know what they're talking about. It's it's You're not getting the whole story. Just think about what happens when a 27-year-old is hospitalized in a mental health setting. They're exhausted. It's exhaustion. It's dehydration. They're dehydrated. Uh, no, they're not. So I'm always used to reading between the lines on what the publicist says, what the doctor says about somebody who is hospitalized or in trouble medically. In this case, I got almost everything I needed to know exactly what was going on, and I was shocked to see the press obsessing about whether or not he was on supplemental O2. What is the one thing you see in every television show as long as there's been a television when somebody's in a hospital? They have what, the little nostril thing. They have the thing in their nose. They have O2 nose. in their nose. All right, so this is, hold on, Drew, don't get worked up. But this is interesting, which is, of course, I just watched the news as a lay person, and, and they, I kept hearing he was on supplemental oxygen. That is not a mild case. He was on oxygen. And, of course, because we're lay people, I wasn't thinking ventilator, but I was thinking, if you're on oxygen, that is not a mild case. And I was going along for that ride but there's a difference between supplemental oxygen and uh what you call like a high, high flow high oxygen, flow oxygen. Or positive pressure oxygen if he were on high flow o2 or desaturating badly they should have asked what was his o2 saturation was it 82 was it 92 and oftentimes doctors will just put the o2 on just because that's what we do in a hospital if you measure the o2 saturation of every flu patient they would desaturate. And if you were hospitalized with the flu, don't you think you'd have the little cannula in your nose? Yes, you would. So that meant nothing. And their obsession about it to me, and now people accusing the doctor of lying, I don't think the doctor knew whether he was on O2 or not because it's such an inconsequential thing. The nurses just sometimes just stick it on board when they're desaturating. So he was like, uh, 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 uh. he was lying. No. Here's the question. Did he have high flow O2? No. Did he have positive pressure O2, like a nasal BiPAP? No, he did not. What they didn't ask was, what did his chest X-ray look like and what did his CAT scan look like? Because they gave only a brief description of that. That would have been very useful information. Mm -hmm. That is the only thing they didn't tell us in detail. Otherwise, I knew exactly what was going on from beginning to end. There was not one point I said, hey, I wish they'd wish they tell me more. They gave him the Regeneron. They had an O2 and a CAT scan with some sort of fluffy infiltrate. I would have liked some more detail on that. He desaturated a little bit. He got better after the Regeneron. They gave him the remdesivir. His fevers went away. They put him on some dexamethasone on the way out the door, which is an aggressive move, but a move that doctors are making more and more now with mild cases. And he got kind of inflated from that. My, Brian can address what it's like to be on dexamethasone. It makes you high. What's inflated? Speeds you up? Or? Speeds you up and makes you flush and feel it big. It literally and, inflates you. Yeah. You get like moon face. Yeah, you, you get that too it. if you aren't long I enough. I had the moon face in 2009. But you can get uh, manic. I, Drew, Drew and I were talking before the show. Uh, I was on dexamethasone off and on for 10, 11 years. Yeah, mm. it's, a, it's a rough drug. And it, it, but it, it, the other thing that worries me is that on the other side of it, when people, particularly when people are very sped up and sort of high, they, he said it, I've never felt this good in 20 years. Oh. That's how you feel on Decadron. Oh, is that what that yeah, is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And well, Drew, the only the only side effect I ever felt from my Avastin infusions mm. was from the Decadron, dexamethasone yeah. they gave me beforehand. Small dose, but still, it would keep me up at night. Yep. I couldn't sleep. Yep. I had to take Ambien. Like I was, I was wired. Like it's wired. I, That's my right. infusion was at 10 a.m. Yep, you're wired. By, by bedtime, I was, you know, w- it's wired a long acting night. medicine. It's a powerful medicine. It's a good medicine, and it should be used more frequently. I think we'll see it more frequently earlier in COVID. Uh, I, the doc, uh, Mr. Trump's treatment was a model. For for how everybody should be treated. And I suspect one day it sort of will be a standard of care, that kind of tr- approach. Uh, we'll see it as, you know, this whole business, like this points out the difference between, you know, who gets health care. No, no. They were very aggressive. You're not going to be that aggressive with the average case. I'll admit that. But with, there can be, easily be a time when everybody gets these this kind of treatment. We're on our way to that in this country, in my humble opinion. Well, what about people of color who we everybody, deny these treatments everybody to? Everybody will get it. Yeah. What if you're gay <laughs> and we won't give you a, a, a steroids? Well, see, to me, I, I'm interested in Drew because all I heard was he's on oxygen, he's on oxygen, that's a big deal. But now that you picture everyone getting oxygen when they just lay down in the hospital bed, then right. you realize that was over. Built high, they didn't know high. to ask. High flow, positive uh, pressure, CAT scan, I, I, chest know, Here's X-ray. kind of my thing in my new world order. Did they not know to ask or is it just sort of better just to go he was on oxygen? I, I can tell I, you by virtue of what, the way I have to study what is com- what press says about medical stories, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Always, when it comes to medicine, right? Especially. But what I'm saying is, is just take this nasty-sounding thing and yeah. run with it. Well, I, I'm not saying there's a it. way to probably you, there's a. You're a news anchor. You're not a medical expert. You have access to medical experts, like I have access to you, and so then I've learned this information. It seems like yeah. they could learn that information yes, if, in fact, that's what their goal was. All right, uh, is it Celine? That's right. Line two, Celine. Hi. Hi. Hey, uh, Celine. I found I found your bottle with the note in it. Yes. Message <laughs> in a bottle. That's right. Now, to be yes. fair, I, I found it. No, I found it in almost real time. I just saw her throw it into the ocean, and she walked away, and it washed up. She didn't. It didn't. It didn't get across the globe. It just kind of <laughs> came back. No. So I it picked did. I picked it up to decide to figure out what was going. How old are you, Celine? I'm 26 years old. Why? Where, where was it thrown from? Do we establish that? In Malibu. Malibu. Okay, so yeah, not very far at all. What uh, and what? Uh, why the message in the bottle? What prompted you to do that? You know, just um, just trying to be, just trying to let go of negative energy in this this crazy world right now that we're living in, just the COVID world, you know, and just kind of, just kind of, kind of loop or losing myself almost and just kind of wanting to just release any negative energy and just kind of, just to release negative energy and just kind of finding myself again, I think. Did, and it, just, did it help? Did you feel the release honestly, of negative energy? Yes. It was instant gratification. almost. Really? Hmm. And yeah. Uh, huh. So, so you went down with that intent to put the message in the bottle. Um, yes. I, you put your phone number in there. That's not something you yes. typically see on Gilligan's Island when the, when the <laughs> yeah. bottle would wash up. <laughs> right. Why did you put the? Why did you put your phone number on there? I don't know because uh, my intent, honestly, I didn't even think anybody was going to really find it, or I thought it was just going to go far away no one's ever gonna find it and i just thought you know what i always see this in movies kind of thing or just hear about it in stories and i was like i want to see if anybody would really just call me or anything and it's just kind of more like if someone going through a hard time as well or anything just to i wanted to see if anybody would contact what, me and look at now i'm on what, a podcast what city Crazy. what city do you live in i live in roner park california so it's in sonoma county yeah oh. roner park Oh, Brian yes. knows. It's up by Santa Rosa, Petaluma. Yes, yes. And so you came down, you, you're going to the beach, you put the message yes. in a bottle, you you threw it, you felt a, a purge, a release of, of stress. Yes. And, yes. And what, you're 26 years of age. Do you, do you have a job or has the COVID thing affected that? <laughs> Well, no. So I am a stay-at-home mom. I have two kids. 
which are two in one. Mm, so that alone is just so much stress and just always, you know, yeah. just, I mean, I'm a stay at home mom. And then just this whole COVID world is just kind of very overwhelming, I feel. And just, yeah, and just going through everyday life situations in relationships or just being a mom, being a daughter, being a sister, you know. Is your is your does your husband work? Has he been affected? Um. Yes, he works. Um. No, he has not been affected because he is an essential worker. Hmm. <laughs> what, what business is he yes. in? He is a police officer. Oh, nice. Now his yes. his he, life must be stressful. He now. must feel a lot of yes. that stress. Yes, I think so too. Right now, just with the whole police situations and all that. Well, so yeah, top, I think it is very stressful. On top of that, there's a lot of fires up there, uh, Celine. I don't know if the fires are close yes. to where you guys are, but that's a yes. huge source so, of stress too. To, yes. Yeah, so today, I I finally get to see a blue sky today, hmm. which is amazing. I haven't got to see one in a while, and it's crazy because it's been very smoky, very just you know. Do, overwhelming do do you feel i i i will speak on behalf of young selena or Celine? sorry um yes i have this theory that there's just too much information going around people are just being mired in information and news and some's real and some's fake it's all it's all just yes. kind of chipping away at us a little bit we need like to go out and build a fort and we need to go throw a bottle at the beach and like, yes. we got to get ourselves. <laughs> I, I feel like people are turning on themselves. Like yes. there's a lot of, yes. we're not, we're not supposed to be questioning our existence this much. You know, we're not supposed to be <laughs> yes. thinking about constantly. We're, well, what we're supposed to be thinking about is like work and kids and life, but we're not supposed to be questioning like, what am I here for? Am I happy? Yeah. Am I sad? What mood am I in this morning? What's going on with me? We need a little more of a, unfortunately, like man and woman without a schedule, it doesn't really work just being left your own devices. Mm -hmm. Most of us just sort of end up chewing on our own mm -hmm. thigh like a dog that's just sort of like we just need that engagement and so when you pull the plug on life which we kind of mm -hmm. did and then you yeah. you pull the plug on life but then you plug in information phones and computers oh, right. and tvs like a constant barrage of news social media news and social media then of course the effect is everyone's sitting around going am i Hungry? Am I horny? Am I tired? Am I smart? Do I, am I kill myself? Dumb? Am I tall? Am I short? What am I doing here? Why? Why? What's everyone else doing here? Eddie Van Halen died. Uh -huh. What's going on? Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean. Yes. Can you, as a young mom, can you unplug? Like, can you take the kids outside and just have a well, nothing kind of moments of nothing? I've yeah, I mean, I've been trying to disconnect, kind of just always, I kind of just always kind of put my phone down. I'm kind of like, I try to be as in tune as possible with my emotions and just be present. Who and, Who is holding you back? A lot of your note was talking about, <laughs> fuck everybody, they're taking my energy. <laughs> yeah. What's going on there? Yeah, it was just kind of, I felt like I was kind of giving myself to a lot, like, not that it's a bad thing to give yourself all to your kids, but just kind of a lot of my energy goes into my kids. A lot of energy, like just um, to being in a relationship and always, I've always felt like I've always kind of been like a caregiver almost. Mm. And I just, I, I kind of almost lost myself almost in a sense. Like I just felt like I wanted, I used to always be like so fearless and just, been spontaneous and just like done whatever I always wanted to do kind of and I just felt like I lost myself and I just wanted to get back to being happy again taking care of myself well you have to wait till your kids are 18 before that happens because <laughs> yeah, exactly it, you so know women, mo moms always complain about this this is in fact what happens <laughs> your kid sucks the life out of you uh, and yeah. yeah, this is a very common complaint. You have to be careful that you don't, uh, that you do take care of yourself. So you're you know, sort of yeah. refueled to be available for your kids. What would yes, you, would that's you, what I felt. do you have a wish for uh, me and your note 
because I, <laughs> I could I frame it. Swear. I could light a cigar with yes. it. I, what would you Please. like me to do? I want you to frame it. Frame it. All right. <laughs> and take a picture with it. I'll, I, the studio bathroom. Remember the remember the self esteem talk we had a little a couple hours ago. Yeah, know. sad. <laughs> you know the thing that. Yeah. So I got to tell you what was funny. I was mm-hmm. this beach. Uh, sorry, this note was discovered a couple of weeks ago when uh, uh-huh. I was walking down the beach in Malibu with uh, my friend uh, Matt DeAndrea, and we ended up back at the Malibu condo. And I, I was dying to see what was on the note. I thought it was going to be a, a recipe for life. I, 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 I was dying to know what was in this note, but the note was in a wine bottle mm. and there, was, yeah. there wasn't a good way to fish it out. And it, it has a you know four inch neck on it. And the note wasn't falling out of the bottle. It was stuck in the body of the bottle. Uh, the mm-hmm. Matt's, Matt's a handy guy. And so I actually had to go somewhere, as I recall, and I left him at the condo. So I just went, you figure out how to fish it out. I'm leaving lock up. And I left. Then when I showed up yesterday at the condo, it had been two weeks and I'd forgotten the bottle was gone and I'd forgotten all about the note. And I walked to the uh, island in the condo and I look down and I just see this thing that looks like feminine riding and it says, I just want to uh, go, sorry, I just want to <laughs> let go. You assume it was Matt's suicide. Of who I was trying to make. <laughs> and all I did was like, oh, Christ, my sister's having a nervous <laughs> fucking breakdown. <laughs> like someone got in here and left one of those notes that guys hate to read. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. what I'm talking about? Oh, any, yes. any, yeah. any dude who's been around the block has seen that chick writing note about how you make them feel. Yes. <laughs> I feel yes. invisible in front of you. And yeah. I'm like, ah. it's just, I, Adam's an asshole mode. <laughs> I'm going to have to get a fucking shaman in here to burn some sage and clear this condo now because of your weird vibe. <laughs> so I start reading this note and I'm like, okay, this is my fucking sister. Or this is Lynette or this is my mom. And I'm reading down. I'm like, who the fuck wrote this? <laughs> so I notice this. Natalia Carolla. That's right. That's what I, th- and they, it clearly looked like it was left out for me. Mm-hmm. And then I'd realize, was- oh, this was the note in the bottle. And now here yes. we are today. Celine, Celine, I, y- yes. you can't just throw a wine bottle into the surf and have it go out to sea. How many times? How many times did you, th- you? How many times did it come back and you threw it back out there? Well, they Not say if it comes back, you set it just free. One time. Oh well, wow. She was there for three days throwing <laughs> this damn bottle. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I threw it at one time, and look who found it, you know? All right, well, we're, we're going to now... It's a big, big riptide where she threw it or something. ...empower you <laughs> to uh, go off and uh, lead your best life. Although, I must say, almost everyone who says, I'm tired of doing everything for everyone, no more, I'm going to focus on me, always assholes that never do anything for anybody, <laughs> ironically. That's my history. That's let's my history with Celine. those people. I promise let's, you let's that's check not in me. with Celine in a year. <laughs> yes. We're going to check in, Celine. Let's talk to Celine's husband. All right. Let's see what his, his yes. version is. Well, he's walking the beat right now. <laughs> and by that, I mean in the bathroom taking care of business. I am so right? happy. And <laughs> I just want to let people know, you know, you're not allowed and you got this. Good. So take care of those kids. Yes. Take care of yourself. Probably yes. wait till after the election to talk to your husband about how stressful things are at home because he's probably stressed okay. out at work. Maybe a couple of weeks after the election. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. And then uh, <laughs> and uh, and we'll check back in with you uh, in a year. From oh, now. thank you so much. Yeah, that'd yeah. be awesome. Thanks, Celine. Nice Good luck, Celine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank- yeah, thanks. Yeah, I was just that's message in a bottle. Went wild. It's pretty cool. Yeah, you guys know that feeling of dread I had with the chick riding and oh. the note going, I here's how you make me feel and oh. I was like, Oh, okay, yeah. no. I haven't I've been it's meaning been a to while. talk to you about this. And you're uh, like, Did I walk into an intervention? <laughs> The, it, it, the modern version of that is getting a long text message from a girl now. Yes. If you, if you look at your phone and there's a long text. Yes. It's <laughs> never a punch list for like, if you're going to be at Anawalt Lumber, you want to pick up a 3 8 uh, lock washer and then a zinc coated half inch washer with a broad rim on it and get finished washers. Now, in terms of lags, now in Decker's, like it's always a big pile of blah. 
I'm just gonna blow, I'm just gonna vomit feelings all over your fucking phone. But it, it's one thing if you're just there to hear the feelings, like Celine was. Then the letter you're talking about is the one where this is how you make me feel. I need oh. you to hear this because you're the source of all this. But you really have to just picture me alone in a condo with this note presented in chick writing, and I've zero context because all I did was. Matt, two weeks ago, had this bottle. I was like, have fun with the note. And I just left. I'd completely yeah. forgotten all about it. I am certain it. you were like, oh. oh who wrote this? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that guys have the universal dread over that. All right. Let me hit uh, red cap here. Yeah. Comfort done right. Making uh, work wear and uniforms since 1923 for essential workers making our community thrive, clothing for uh, many different industries, automotive, culinary, manufacturing, waste management, oil block coveralls, resist the engine fluids. If they're uh, tra- if you're changing that, you get a little on yourself, no problemo. Uh, the oil just uh, beads up and rolls off. Um, their latest project is for uh, what they call road heroes, truckers, man. Truckers, the uh, trucker tab. A $50,000 tab at Cracker Barrel to feed our long-haul truckers. You can check out truckertab.com. You know, these guys, Yeah, everyone always talks about the nurses and the people, the first responders and the people working at the hospitals and the people working at the Trader Joe's. But what about the people hauling all that stuff everywhere in parts unknown? These are the truckers. You can donate too. I did it myself. Go to truckertab.com truckertab.com and donate red cap work where done right all right let's see we're gonna have uh, martin cove is gonna be in in a couple of few um eh, we got our oh i don't know mm. i'll tell you my mike august story because it'll make drew and it'll Ooh, make uh i'm ready it'll make brian laugh which is now, we've all had Mike August type conversations with Mike August. Like, they're very Mike August. You've had Mike August emails, oh, Drew? Emails, I was going to say. I've had Mike, the, the- Mike August emails are imp- they're incredibly efficient. Mm-hmm. Maximum <laughs> seven words, maximum, yeah. uh, but usually impenetrable. Well, they say brevity is the soul of confusion. <laughs> <laughs> So I appreciate Mike, the efficiency, though. Mike sends it. super confusing, uh, super confusing emails, but we also have super confusing conversations. And this was a classic Mike August conversation, classic, because Mike is a nice guy, but he's got a little bit of a nasty streak. And once he gets onto something, he's the kind of guy who hunkers down on it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I think the president may have this, he's, which is like, it's a kind of, you know, the people you argue with and Mike's an attorney. You can kind of show them the light and they'll suck down a little harder on their first point yep. just to really bring it home. Yep. You don't have that Drew, nope. but Mike, does. I used to though, probably, but Mike doesn't, you beat it out of Mike me. does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're sitting on Gergus's conditioned. <laughs> we're sitting on Gergus's private jet and we're flying home from Salt Lake City. And as we fly, we're looking out the window. And by the way, boy, you talk about, you know, hey, is there room in this country? Between Salt Lake City and Simi Valley or uh, you know, I'm trying to think uh New Hall Sog is flying into LA, there is nothing. Yeah. There is not a structure yeah. between literally Salt Lake City, at least the way we flew, Salt Lake City to Los Angeles. You look down, it is just there's nothing there. Yeah, I, there's not a it, building. It, except I, it, one or two round green. Yeah, a couple <laughs> of those. What is and that? Like on one the solar nowhere. farm or whatever. Yeah. But there is physically nothing. Like when they go, yeah. we don't have room in this country. We're overcrowded. Oh, my God, oh, no. boy. Oh, oh yeah. The so desert. wide open. I wrote a stat two years ago that only three percent of this country was urbanized. Yeah, it's like not only three percent right. is cities. You yeah. know what I mean? It's yeah. all it's rural or it's country or whatever. Yeah, that's about we, right. You or fly, you fly in a private jet and you just stare out that window and there was nothing Desert. between here and there. And Desert. at some point we started coming up on the Colorado River and uh, then we started coming up on uh, Dam, uh, Hoover baby. Dam. And I said, you know, Hoover Dam. I said we shot the cold opening to the Man Show on Hoover I remember, Dam, I and that. I said. 
Way back when, when uh, Hal Gurney, Hal Gurney was the famous director for Letterman, way back in the early days of Letterman, very early days when Dave would say, Hal, how much time we got? Or Hal, who's coming in next? Or Hal, that was Hal Gurney, famous. And we brought him in and he directed some man shows. And he's a lovely man, lovely man. And he's older. And he was old when we were doing the pilot for the man show. And I, he, he's a, a gentleman, a woodworker, a, a great soul. And I said, um, geez, is Hal Gurney, he directed the first episode. Is he still around? And uh, Mike did not miss a beat. Mike said, uh, no, he's dead. And I said, <laughs> uh, huh, Hal Gurney's dead. Yeah, he's dead. I said, how... You know, Hal Gurney was a friend and a good friend and a good friend of Danny Two Sheets and Jimmy. And I feel like Jimmy and Danny Two Sheets would have told me immediately. I would have been in on a long text thread about Hal Gurney. Died, particularly if he died of COVID. It just died. <laughs> yeah. These, it could have died two years ago. Yeah. I would have. I felt like I would have known about it. Yeah. So I said, uh, is he dead? Now, we don't have any reception in the air, so we don't, we don't know what's going on. And... And Mike goes, oh, yeah, he's dead. And I said, did, did you hear he was dead? Now, I'm curious because you heard he was dead. I worked with him. I didn't hear he was dead. How come Daniel didn't tell me he was dead? Where did you find out he's dead? He went, when he when he did the man show pilot, he was like 75 years old. That would make him 95. Like, he's he's dead. And I said, okay, hold on. He's dead because you think he's dead or he's dead because you heard he's dead? He's dead. Mm-hmm. I go, I, okay, he's, but there's such a thing as him being old and alive. Yes, there's such a thing. Yeah, right. He's dead. Believe me, he's dead. I go, okay, please. I just want to try to get some clarity. Did you hear that Hal Gurney had died, or are you just telling me he's dead because in, he's too old to be alive? And he goes, um, How, it took a long time, didn't it, Chris? It took a long <laughs> time. You going for a while. <laughs> we, 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 were, we, we did about 400 nautical miles. <laughs> and I go, look, Norman Lear is old. Mm -hmm. Norman Lear is 96 years old, but he's alive, but he's very old, but he is alive. Is Hal Gurney dead? Or is he uh, because you heard he died? Or are you just telling me he's dead because you've done the math? He's He'd be 100 years old. But he won't stop and correct so eventually i pound it out of him which is he never heard he died right he's telling me doing he died math. because he's doing the math which he toggled back and forth on and i said but we don't know it right and he's like i know it he's dead anyway got home hit uh, the tarmac as soon as you hit the tarmac I'm Al Gurney, the 85 years young yeah. and going strong yeah so I thank God we had a 40 minute conversation, <laughs> right? It went on way too. Could have just said, I don't know. Right? <laughs> that he could have easily said that. He says it with such conviction, and that's that's how he gets I have it. learned for a long he had a lot of conviction learned. for a long period of time. And my conviction was he's definitely old, but my circle would have informed me if Hal Gurney died. Advice to all y'all. I've been with this man longer than any of you all combined. If you're certain, make sure you are certain, certain. Do not do anything with certitude unless you are really, like you just read it before you got on the plane. Yeah, well, anyway, the great Hal Gurney is still uh, walking amongst us. May uh, rest in peace. May rest in peace. All right, uh, let me hit uh, my hitting blinds here, Max Pana. Blinds galore. First place to go for custom blinds, shades, shutters, and drapes online. Family owned and run for 20 years plus. Great Drew people. gets yep, all his stuff I there. I get all my stuff there. Uh, they've covered over 2 million windows. And uh, you can do it all from your home. You take the measurements, you customize them online. They have a build a blind tool, shows you exactly how your blind and shades are going to look on the screen before you buy. Save a ton compared to big box stores. Get the designer look without the designer price tag. Stuff is nice, it works, it keeps the heat out, especially in these hot climates. Mm. And uh, it helps it help keep the heat in when it gets cold outside. Hand-built from scratch, delivered right to your door, and created just for your windows. And, uh, again, uh, you can hook them up to your uh, Amazon Alexa device. Uh, 
as well. So you can be smart. You can charge it up and down automatically. I have them in my bedroom. I have them everywhere. It's Blinds Galore, right, Dawson? Blinds Galore makes it easy for you to get the safe, high-quality designer blinds and shades you've always wanted in your home, all at a great price, all at up to 45% off. See for yourself at BlindsGalore.com today and let them know that Adam sent you. That's BlindsGalore.com. All right, Dr. Drew, the Dr. Drew and uh, the Adam and Dr. Drew show, available on Apple Podcasts as well, drdrew.com, mm-hmm. for more podcasts YouTube, and information. YouTube. And live streams as well. Yep. YouTube, we're going to be, Drew's going to be the guest at the Cajun Dome in Lafayette coming up October 24th, so uh, enjoy that as well. We'll take a break. I'll dismiss Drew, and uh, the great Martin Cove will be in right after this. In the spirit of Murrow, Jennings, Cronkite, here's another great moment in local news. A man's death is being blamed on black licorice. Yes, the uh, 54-year-old Massachusetts construction worker was reportedly eating a bag and a half of the candy every day for a few weeks. Doctors say an acid found in black licorice threw off his nutrients, causing his heart to stop. And the FDA warns as little as two ounces a day for two weeks can cause a heart rhythm problem. Doctors hope it raises awareness. That is bizarre. It really bizarre. I don't have to worry about that. I'm not really a fan of licorice. <laughs> right? You, you too. And me both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a great moment in local news. Now, back to the Adam Carolla Show. Well, welcome back to the show, Martin Cove, Cobra Kai, the TV show. It's available now on Netflix, uh, renewed for a fourth season. By the way, dominated Nielsen's streaming charts at the uh, end of August uh, with nearly 2.2 billion, billion with a B, streaming minutes. So uh, congratulations. And the word of mouth, is it is it all word of mouth, Martin? Well, it's all word of mouth. It's all word of mouth until you see it. Then you see why the word of mouth is so strong. You know, it's just, they haven't been doing a lot of press except some promos, but you know, Netflix, they they literally dubbed it in 38 languages. Hmm. They had 199 million, 199 million viewers, which translates to about three, four people in Per family in a house, so it's 400 million viewers to wow. a show that was aired on YouTube, you know, a couple of years ago, and it still holds its own, you know. Well, the thing that's amazing about this new world order, which is first off, there are no bad ideas just on their face, like when you hear Cobra Kai, we're gonna reboot the whole the Karate Kid thing. It just, it sounds, it sounded a little insane, but if the product is there, the product is there. And if the product is great, then people watch it and people share it and you can't buy that. And it's always funny when people say to me, like, I want to do a video and I want it to go viral. It's like, it can't go viral. You can just do the best video or the funniest video or the most interesting video you can do and hope people share it. Yeah, you really, you have to, right now it's an ideal time. So for a show that's about nostalgia, for a show that uses flashbacks about nostalgia, it's a time when we all need to feel good. All that and and the fact that we went from YouTube to Netflix, who do, you know, a lot more promotion and have a lot more viewers, all that works into the success of the show. But without good writing, without your little video, your video and, without the good writing of anything, the Karate Kid one, two, or three, we don't have it. We're still saying lines like wax on, wax off, no mercy, sweep the leg, 35 years later. Like we're still saying the force be with you. We're still saying play it again, Sam. We're still saying Frankie Scarlet, I don't give a damn, you know? Because the writing on those projects were superior. They were just wonderful. I'm looking, and- I'm, I'm looking down at your TV credits. I'm seeing all these old shows like Kojak and Cagney and Lacey and uh, Gunsmoke. And I'm looking at uh, getting your start with Gentle Ben. Uh, Gentle Ben is a show I used to watch when I was a kid about uh, a bear 
that mm-hmm. l- lived with a young child, Clint Howard, Ron Howard's brother, in the Everglades. And Dennis Weaver from McLeod and Duel, I think, was like the game warden in the Everglades. And Gentle Ben was the friend of Clint Howard. Now, I, how old were you when you did that part? That's the original Gentle Ben, and you have a very good memory because I watched that. <laughs> Gentle Ben that you're talking about was a remake on Hallmark, where they put me in, in as the person who raises the bear. It was like a Rambo character who lives in the woods. <laughs> well, what so year like, What year was that? That would have been Gentle Ben, so it would have been 2001, 2002. Oh, so got his start on Gentle Ben with Clint Howard is probably not accurate information. No, I don't think so. Because <laughs> that, I mean, you know, you would have been, I don't know, 16 and a half or something if that. But it's a good credit because it brings me back to the days when that show that you watched and when I watched on Gunsmoke. Mm-hmm. When I came into Hollywood the first year I was in Hollywood, I got a chance to work with James Arness and I guest starred on Gunsmoke, David Huddlestone, and, and it was a gas. And, you know, it was just about, I guess, about four years after I did my first, my first bit part as a speaking in a movie called Little Murders, directed by Alan Arkin. And it got cut out of the movie, but it was so much fun that... You know, it turned me on to wanting to come to Hollywood three years later. I, I got to warn you that according to Wikipedia, your the first line is uh, that you appear in the Gentle Ben series, from, which ran from 67 to 1969 on, on CBS with Clint Howard. So we're going to have to get your publicist to go back and, and clean oh that God, thing up. Wikipedia. You know, they, too, they have me too old in ID, IMDb. So we got to do both Wikipedia and IMDb. Got to fix that shit, man. Did, um, so did you have, uh, this is a stupid question. Uh, it, could you have foreseen this whole karate kid being what it was when it was like, it's, it's such a, in, 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 in many ways, it's such a small movie, the original karate kid. It, it really is a small movie. I don't mean that, uh, pejorative way i just mean it's a small little story it's kind of a local thing you know it's all the the all valley tournament it's in the san fernando valley it, it's not a big it's not a big movie it, at the time wasn't filled with big stars it, it, it this did you see it coming did you do did you film it and then sort of forget about it and it came out a year later how did that work yeah, that, that was kind of it we we never even liked the karate kid uh, title. It felt like a Bruce Lee movie. We, I treated it like just another heavy. Mm-hmm. I remember just a few directions from John Avelson saying, don't give me the Marty Cope twinkle. I want this guy, John Kreese, like death. Right. You know? That's what he kept think, telling me to think about. And, you know, as time progressed, I never felt, as years progressed, I never felt that the stars were Ralph and Pat. I felt the star was Robert Mark Kamen, who wrote it, who wrote this wax on, wax off, integrated so much. And to me, all the top movies that we love are all based on good writing, all based on good writing, despite the chemistry. Back in those days, I was arrogant enough to think, well, if I did a little movie, and I love the part, but the script is not great, I can embellish it and make it terrific. And of course, we all know you can't. You don't have it on the page. It's not going to, no matter how good the performances are, it's not going to improve. Karate Kid was just something that everybody identified with, whether they were bullied, whether they were fish out of water, or whether they they had a romance that didn't work out. You know, it just penetrated everyone's soul. And as the years went by, it was shown a lot on cable. And once it hit, the writing again was so rich and so gray with today white hats and black hats like the karate kid movies are not popular. It is the gray. It's the gray elements in a script that the kids identify with. You know, Brian, you know who else agrees with you about uh, it's got to be on the page. The great Bob Evans producer, Bob Evans. You can have stars up the ass. 
But if it's not on the page, it's not going to be on the screen. So you're right about that, as according to Mr. Evans. But I did have a question for you. I'm glad you brought up John My, Allison. Mike Argus. Mike Argus says he's still alive. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, you, I'm glad you mentioned John Avildsen because uh, Adam's uh, production company distributed the documentary King of the Underdogs, which you were in, about John yeah. Avildsen. And it was it was great. I enjoyed it so much because he's a you know, great director and uh, eye-opening. I didn't know a lot about him. Would you mind just talking about your experiences with him? I mean, whatever you want, casting or on the set. I'm just curious uh, what he was like to yeah. work with. He did, well, Rock, did he direct Rocky he as did well? Rock, Rocky, right. Yes. Sorry, go Rocky ahead. and Joe. Right. And so I, I, I probably didn't tell you the story. So I, I get the script, Karate Kid script, and I get it on a Monday from this woman, Carol Jones. She said, you have all week with it. We're going to bring you in on Friday to meet with John Abelson. So this is 1983. I'm doing Cagney and Lacey. I said, oh, I read it over. It's just another heavy. Then she calls me first thing in the morning, Tuesday morning, and says, you've got to be at 12 o'clock. John's shooting the scene. They've already started shooting. He's shooting the movie. It's now or never. I'm viciously just so angry. So my wife says to me, use the venom you're feeling. And the scene was marching up and down the dojo. It's mercy is for the weak. Here and on the street, someone confronts you, blah, blah, blah. So I use it all. And then I go into the audition to meet Caro Jones and John. And I look at John and I say, John, you're a real asshole. We wait for years to meet directors of your caliber. And now you don't give me any time to... To, to practice and develop this role. You're a real asshole. And so are you, Carol Jones. Mercy is for the weak, <laughs> here and on the streets. I go right into it. He loves it. Sends me to Jerry Weintraub. Do the same thing to Jerry Weintraub. I berate him. I don't give a shit. Just berate him. <laughs> he stops me halfway through it. He says, loves me. Sends me to Guy McElwain, the head of the studio. I couldn't quite do it to Guy McElwain, but <laughs> I did it in the bathroom and then came out with the same kind of emotions, you know? But John was a great guy. You, you just hang with him. He lived with a camera on his shoulder. You know, he just videoed everything. And um, when we did that video that Billy Zapka directed, um, uh, the one about the pizza boy and all, John was there with a video camera at, at the red carpet, red carpeting everybody, you know, with his video. He was a great guy. He's, I spoke at the memorial and, uh, He's truly missed. He's truly missed. You know what I think back on, and I was just thinking about it. Um, so I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. I guess they moved to Reseda or some place like that. Uh, I think when they moved out, uh, as far as the storyline, you can look it up, Chris. I think the storyline is they... Reseda. Reseda? Reseda. Yeah, yeah. so Reseda's couple of towns or cities over from where I grew up in North Hollywood. And what a lot of people don't know is that the gardeners in the 50s, the 60s, and even into the early 70s were Japanese. In the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles, the gardeners were Japanese. My grandparents had Mr. Otaki. He was a Japanese gardener. Like, it seems insane when you live in Southern California now to picture a Japanese guy pulling up in a pickup truck and getting out and raking the leaves and being the gardener. But the Japanese in California or maybe in Los Angeles were the gardeners of the day. And I now sort of realize as I was as I was thinking about Mr. Miyagi, like, was that a San Fernando Valley Japanese gardener sort of carryover? Like, was, was, was that his job? Because that was a prominent job for Japanese, for the Japanese in, in SoCal back, back in the day. Um, I he don't was know. a handyman. But he was, he, he worked, but he was, but obviously he was doing all that stuff. At, he was doing all the bonsai stuff and all the, all that stuff back at his, back at his place. Right. Wasn't he, at least in Karate Kid. Two yeah, or three tree. was he doing the bonsai thing? He had the bonsai tree. Yeah. He he, yeah, he was the bonsai tree and he was the handyman. But, you know, every one of those places had some little maintenance man that took care of you, you know, in those in those little complexes. And, um, yeah, most of the time they they were oriental because now most a lot of gardeners are, are Mexican gardener and 
and always did have a Mexican, even when I lived in Santa Clarita, and, you know, yeah, they, they were. They, the transition, I think that the transition, yeah, the transition, you know, began about 10 years ago, 20, 20 years ago, because now every gardener I've ever had, even if I got rid of them, was, was not an Oriental. Yeah, that's uh, again. I just had these weird little flashbacks of Mister. Yeah, you're right, Mister Otaki, right. <laughs> like wearing a pith helmet. You know, like wearing a gardener's uniform. Mm-hmm. Literally, like remember, people would wear a uniform for like if you were a gardener. Wide brimmed. Yeah. yeah, you didn't show up in sweatpants and flip flops, man. You had your stuff on, and it was kind of interesting because, I, and I learned this lesson when I was a carpenter, which is taking this thing that you feel like is sort of manual labor and kind of boring and raking leaves and trimming back hedges and stuff, but turning it into a little bit of a professional science, like, like these guys had a sort of, they were sort of meticulous, like their shirts were tucked in, they had their little holster with their clippers on it and stuff. And there was, there seemed to be this pride in it versus sort of cranking it out, like see how many houses we can hit in a day. And then, and, and he seemed sort of content. Do you know what I mean? Like he, it, like there was some sort of um, precision in this. Like it was uh, Mr. Miyagi working on a bonsai tree. Was it? Was it? Was it two or three where he was going to plant the or get the bonsai tree off the side of the cliff? That was that was three. That was three. That was great. <laughs> the barns and all that, but the. I think that the word is when they had a uniform on, any one of these people, whether they were moving men or they were, um, you know, I I flash back now on some of these commercials where they they come in as appliance fixing your washer Mm -hmm. or your dryer. They always had the integrity of a uniform. Mm -hmm. And I think all these people would truly enjoy that. They enjoyed that that, that when you see even a good war movie, which is the antithesis of, of, you know, plants and being a gardener, but that, that outfit, well, I just watched Black Hawk Down mm-hmm. and because uh, Tom Sizemore and I are planning a project together. Oddly enough, Black Hawk Down came on that night and, you know, everybody was quite fastidious in their outfits. And when you look at even the Civil War, they changed them around so much, but the Civil War m- movies, you know, the officers are quite fastidious. And I think there's a great deal of pride in wearing a uniform. Yeah, I I agree. Like, I'm not, I'm not who you would, you wouldn't think I'd be a school uniform guy, but I kind of am a school uniform guy. Like, I think it, I think you kind of act the part. And I think, like, I look at the same way as, like, people used to dress to fly, and now they don't dress to fly and they try to choke flight attendants who tell them to put out their vape pens or whatever. And I think there's a correlation. Black Hawk Down, by the way, one of our favorite and Brian's favorite war war movie of all time, maybe. Right, Love Brian? It. Yeah, no, it was my number one. Was that the first time you'd seen it, Martin? No, no, I'd seen it before. But, you know, it just was interesting. We had, we had a three-hour meeting about um, a Western at the house, and we were just smoking cigars, talking. He left. I put on the TV. This was Tuesday, Wednesday, last week, or Thursday last week, and then it was Black Hawk Down. And I said, well, how interesting it is. Tom just left. Let's just throw it on and watch it. But, you know, my you guys were so kind to my son who did this other movie about pretty much, you know, war. Was He did right. this movie called D-Day and Weston Cage. Right. He did it with Weston Cage, right. Nick's son. And you guys were so gracious to him. I, I, I put that as a note to... Thank you for being so gracious to him. You're welcome. I'm reading here that according to the Los Angeles Times, at at one time in Los Angeles, uh, it was estimated that one in every four Japanese American men was a gardener. Hmm. Can you imagine one? That's crazy. 25% of Japanese American males who lived in Los Angeles were gardeners. Could you imagine that is such a crazy profession and of, of all things gardeners you just don't you don't think about that but it's a good it's a kind of a good example of japanese men going i'm going to be a gardener fine my son is going to be a doctor 
And that's kind of what this what this country's about, I would say, on a patriotic well, note. The, greatest, the most difficult statistic to follow is that 1920 to 1967, one out of every three movies coming out of this town was a Western from oh, yeah. 1920 to 67. Wow. That means it was such an it was such an overexposed genre that you wonder now why we don't see those kind of movies based on that statistic in Cowboys and Indians magazine. You know? Wait, sorry. Sometimes you're... I think statistics help us, sometimes they hinder us, you know? Did um Getting back to Tom yeah. Sizemore, what kind of shape is Tom Sizemore in? Is he sober? Is he lucid? I've met a few different versions of Tom Sizemore. No, he's lucid. He's sober. He's terrific. And um, the project was a really interesting project written by Alexander Troy about the um, the uh, Trail of Tears problem back in 1876. Mm -hmm. And you know the, the the tribes being moved from um, uh, Nebraska to Oklahoma, and it was a wonderful political take that is a very good look that should be done. And we, you know, I'm I've been trying to get some westerns done for a long time. So he came over and we just had some good good conversations, very creative stuff with the writer and, and my son. And uh, you know, we're going to end up making it. It's very exciting, and he was in great shape and. You know, very articulate. And Tom's good. He's good. Because I know him from some of those stories. Mm -hmm. You know, we did a couple of autograph shows together. <laughs> oh, but, uh, boy. You know? I'm laughing because, you know, as someone who, uh, you know, who who's guilty of tilting a two now and again, if, if there's a there's just settings you know what I mean? And it's like, hey, if you got to go up on stage for 90 minutes and do stand up, you could have a couple of beers, but you can't be lit up. You just can't. It's you're going to have a hard time doing that. On the other hand, if you ever catch me on a long flight, uh, that'll be a different version. And autograph session sounds like the kind of place you could uh, you, you could be altered a little bit and still do your job. Yeah, you could. You just sit there, you know, you just hang out. But he, he's great. You know, we, we had stories about, you know, coming up at the same times and doing, you know, he was very lucky to do some wonderful movies. I wish everybody out there on the planet could watch Save It and Private Ryan right now in this day and age. I would love to, I wish I had the, the time and the energy to send the DVD to everybody all over the place and watch for the sake of patriotism and for the sake of, of basically you know, what our country is about back in 1944. And, it, it, and I think it's Spielberg's best work, very uh, best work. And I just watched it last week again. I love that movie. It is, it is one of the, I don't know, there's about five or ten movies for me that if I run into them, I just watch the rest. It's that movie, Defending Your Life with Albert Brooks. I have a, I have a few of those movies where if I just land on it, I'll just stay with it. And, uh, Saving Private Ryan is is definitely one of those movies. The uh, the autograph circuit, the the memorabilia, the autograph things, the going. I know it's a big deal for like the sci fi world and Comic Con and stuff like that. Is it becoming a big deal for just all movies in the, in all genres? It, it, yeah, you can do some interesting things in the horror world. I, I don't do that, you know. Um, but there was a movie we did, Fred Williamson, Stephen Lang, David Patrick Kelly, William Sadler. We did this movie about, it's called VFW. And we did it because the camaraderie was so rich in the movie. It's about a VFW bar. But it was a hor it was very bloody, horror movie. And the amount of attention it got in all these magazines, horror magazines, you know, autograph shows, it was incredible because neither one of us, any of us, do those kind of films. We just don't do those bloody movies. And and I think Last House on the Left was the last time I did it, which was Wes Craven's first picture. Mm -hmm. So that was 1972, you know? A lot of action because people want to be with some of their favorites. They want to go and have, shake a hand, take a picture with them. I think these eight by 10 businesses 
just passe. But the little picture they'll take with their phone, the smile you, they get from you, it makes a world of difference. And I'm still, I'm still fascinated by it all. You know, I'm a little jaded when it comes to business and making deals and, and experiencing what's going on with Cobra Kai. I was there in the 80s, so I kind of go back and forth with jubilance and being jaded. But the bottom line is, you can't beat a person's smile at those autograph shows when they really appreciate that you're alive. Uh, can I, uh, I'll tease this one because I got to do a quick spot, but uh, Rambo part two, I want to know all your recollections of that and how that came about and Stallone and whatever, whatever you got from Rambo part two. Now Rambo part one, which was just first blood is just a kind of gritty outdoorsy kind of adventure movie that doesn't really resemble the later ones. If people watch it, well, in a weird way, uh, here I'm going to tease this for you and Brian, uh, Mr. Cove, because you're both you're both encyclopedias of of uh, movie knowledge. What came further? So the first, I'll tease it, but the the first Rocky was you know pretty slow and gritty and kind of plotting, and it was a real character study. And then of course. Rocky four, Rocky five, you know, they became sort of a caricature of the original movie, but Rambo first blood, the first Rambo first blood was another kind of gritty kind of plotting kind of character study that then turned into a bigger than life, you know, greased up shirt off, you know, flaming arrow thing, which one, which franchise traveled further from its original destination, I'll, I'll let you both uh, argue that out in a second. First, let me tell you about uh, Bet Online. Football is up and running. It's in full swing. NBA Finals are, well, you better get on that while you can because uh, there's not too many left. MLB playoffs are up and running, and uh, you can still get in on the action at Bet Online. Raiders at Chiefs coming up this Sunday. Eagles at Steelers. Giants at Cowboys. Broncos, Patriots. Uh, Vikings at Seahawks, Dolphins at uh, Brian's 49ers. More options to wager than anywhere online from spreads to totals to props. You get in on season opening bonuses as well. And you can wager on division and championship futures as well. Head to Bet Online today. Take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Visit betonline.ag, our exclusive partner, Podcast One. And don't forget promo code Podcast One for your sign up bonus today. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. All right, Brian, why don't you go first? Thoughts on that challenge? So both of these franchises have taken similar journeys, but to answer your specific question, Rambo by far is the most uh, ex extensive journey. That was a cat and mouse uh, in the woods movie uh, on American soil uh, about this, like uh, basically it was proxy for all Vietnam veterans, right? The guy was suffering from PTSD. He had to be talked down by his old colonel from like he was crying and talking about how bad the veterans had it. Like it was kind of, maudlin with yes. like some some uh, violence sprinkled in by the time you get to the more recent movies that are really just called Rambo he is a killing machine a mercenary sent almost you know, all around the world to just slaughter uh, indigenous people and uh, he, he's a kill, he's a cold-blooded killer he just kills hundreds and thousands of people on screen so these movies have gone I think the Rambo movie is the answer it's gone the, the farthest Martin Cove thoughts well, Sly and I go back a long time. We had the same personal manager named Kuno Spoonholz back in the <laughs> early 70s. He would get shot, he would get Sly jobs in uh, Baronet, at the Baronet Theater as an usher. He'd get me a job as a Santa Claus in Abraham and Strauss in Brooklyn. Wow. And we go back, you know, as far back as Capone, our first movie, 74, and Basically, you know, we did, I think we did that in Death Race 2000. And I remember being on the set in Death Race, Death Race 2000. And he sa I said, what do you got? And we were in the motorhome and he says, I got this red script. It's a boxing movie. I'm trying to get it made. And that was like 1975, February. And then sure enough, you know, r the rest is history. And years later, I, I got in touch. You know, we, we, I guess I was hot off Karate Kid 1. 
And boom, I get this offer to come play Erickson and to play in this movie. And I loved First Blood One. I mean, Brian Denny, he's a friend of mine. I think everybody did a great job. But, you know, yeah, I, he was Herbie great. Nannis, you know, and, and, and Herbie Nannis was Sly's manager and my manager at the time. And this was probably 83. And I said, I, gotta, I get this script and it's all pink pages of mayhem. 84 pages of nothing but mayhem. I had, <laughs> Sounds Sly, had, Sly had nine lines. I had more words than he did. And I'm going through this page, this thing in my dressing room at Cagney and Lacey. And I'm saying, you know, all I do is fly the helicopter. I shoot a couple of guns, blah, blah, blah. But I got to make this movie because this movie is going to be another hundred million dollar movie. I got to follow up Karate Kid with something good. Sure enough, I signed for it. We went down to Thailand. We had a terrific time. Sly and I got really friendly all over again. And he's a very creative guy, very funny character. And I'm so happy for him that he was able to get the Expendables going again, you know. But the bottom line is, it's a tough movie. And he and George Cosmodos literally, you know, Sly, George was under the, the, the thumb of Sly. And George did a great job on Tombstone, I think. But on this Rambo, it was what Sly wanted. Sly would see all the takes, you know. And it, 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 was, it was a really terrific action picture that when I first saw it, my wife fell asleep. We're in Tom Laughlin's house in his screening room. Billy Never Jack. Played. Billy Jack. We played tennis at his house in the day. In the evening, we'd watch a, screen, a, a movie and we watched Rambo. And it was the first time I'd seen it. And my wife fell asleep. Or enough explosions to keep her awake? <laughs> I, I, I just, how do you fall asleep watching Rambo? It was, you know. I, my, my experience is if I put my wife in any room and shut the lights, she will fall asleep. If, if, she, <laughs> if she was making an omelet in the kitchen and I just shut the light, she would fall asleep standing over an open flame. Like, one of those goats. W women, I have <laughs> noticed when women watch and you turn the lights off, you put them in a screening room, they just nod off. I, I know it sounds personal because you're, you're in it. My, my, I, I just feel like that's, that's a thing that's built into almost all, all women. And I would defend your wife by saying if people can fall asleep driving an automobile, they can fall asleep in front of Rambo too. But Tom yeah, just, Laughlin, playing tennis with Tom Laughlin, that's, yeah, that's something we got to talk about. That was fun. He, you know, every Saturday he'd have people over the house and he lived in Brentwood. And it was like he'd be the king. So you invite a lot of people. It wasn't just you invite four people to play, you know, doubles. He would invite like 10, 12, 14 people. And he'd walk around. Okay, Marty, you play. Charlie, you play. Val, you play. And you wanted to play and get up and do it. So it was like the coach, while well, everybody's waiting on the bench, it was the coach choosing who's going to start. <laughs> you know? And we had a great time because we all rotated. But, you know, it was sort of like Billy Jack. He ran it with an iron fist. You know, he ran the tennis games with an iron fist. And then, of course, he went to this, it was like a log cabin out of Montana. And you went to his screening room and you watched a good movie every, you know, when it was always Saturday night. So this one was Rambo. Wow. But then again, I have to, my girlfriend, prison girlfriend now, still very good friends with my ex-wife, but my girlfriend now, on our first date, she had a screening room out in, 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 the, um, up in the suburbs, and we watched Casablanca, my favorite movie of all time. And she fell asleep oh, in Casablanca. Outrageous. Maybe it's some pheromone that you exude that actually just <laughs> knocks out your opponents like you would do with your fists in all those action movies. Wow, Tom Laughlin from Born Losers to Billy Jack, you but you want to talk about spinning things off. It was Billy Jack, and then there was the trial of Billy Jack, and then Billy Jack goes to Washington, and maybe I don't know if there was three. There may have been a fourth Billy Jack. I can't even I can't even recall. But he, we were looking at Billy Jack the other day. You know that thing cost I don't know eight hundred and fifty thousand bucks to make and pulled down like forty million. The first one, I mean, he. That must have bought him that that house in Brentwood, right? 
Well, remember what he did. He took it back from Warner Brothers and he four-walled it, which means he went around to the different theater chains and sold them that this movie is saleable. This movie can make some bucks. And he did that all over the country. And that was the first one in 40 million. He, you know, probably sequels always make me 20, 30 million more. So he had three, four of them and um, did very well for himself. Did, did he, he, he bought it back from the film company after shooting he it? He got it back on some deal. He got it back. I don't know how much money exchanged. Probably had to give them some bread, but it didn't do well. So he said, let me do it. Let me for they called it four walling at right. the time. And let me go to the independent independent theater owners. I'll get this thing in profit. And he told us that story. And it was a mensch. The guy was a mensch. You know, he, he did he was he was a terrific guy. I was so sorry to see him, you know, just fade away and he was in a wheelchair and then he passed away. But he was a solid guy. Good and it was a good the one movie that was a bizarre movie was The Master Gunfighter. I don't know if you ever saw that, but it was like he was a gunfighter, but he had carried samurai swords. It was true bastardization of any genre we know, you know. But it was fun. It was a fun movie. Do you remember some we of the? Down do the you line. Some of the? Oh, sorry. Do you remember some of the characters or celebrities that may have shown up at Tom Laughlin's uh, tennis parties back in the day? Lyle Wagner. Lyle who Wagner. Used to be on Wonder Woman. Yes. There all the time. Um, God. Ooh, who else was there? Lyle um, Wagner was, was early... Lyle Wagner was Wonder Woman's sort of boyfriend and also right. I think was Carol Burnett. He was the he he just played the good looking slab of man meat on Carol Burnett. Whenever they needed a good looking guy to come in, that was Lyle Wagner, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean that that was you know that was far better than the Wonder Woman stuff. That was, you know, that was true comedy back in those days. And what she did and all, just brilliant. So I was lucky to experience both ends of the spectrum. A typical TV, you know, a, a TV hit about Wonder Woman and superheroes. But to start out on live television like that. That's that's what I, I wish I could have done. That God, you remember? I would, have liked, I would have liked to have been born in about 1910, so I could have done all the pirate. By the time 1930 came, I could have done all the pirate movies and all the westerns I wanted to do in the 30s and 40s. You know? Do you uh, you remember any other names from uh, back then? The Tom Laughlin uh, tennis parties. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, Kathy, she did a, a, a very athletic video. Um, uh, Catherine, not Catherine Ross, Catherine, ooh, there was a lot of them. It, this goes back to the late seventies. I'm trying to think. Catherine Ross was the mom from happy days, right? Catherine Ross. No, Catherine, mom from happy days. No, that was something Ross. Oh, it wasn't Catherine Ross. Catherine Ross was the graduate. Oh, okay. So now I'm dating myself. Sam Elliott's wife. Yeah. But I'm trying to think. Marion Ross was Happy Days. Damn it. Marion Ross. There yeah. you go. Yeah. But there was, God, it was several of us that would, would show up there. Uh, a couple of the Bridges boys would show up there. Ah, and, the Bridges. Yeah. And there was a couple of these young starlets that I haven't seen in a long time. I bet you they know, haven't changed was... a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right, Martin, let me give you a, a plug for uh, before we let you go. Obviously, Cobra Kai is the name of the show. It's available on Netflix, and uh, third season is uh, scheduled to release uh, January 2021, so just around the corner. And uh, you can shoot him a tweet at Martin Cove, K-O-V-E, uh, if you like, as well. Hey, Martin, thanks for uh, joining us. I hope we can see you in person soon. Tell me what you want to have happen in season four. Are you up on, you know, we start season four, January, January 18th. Ooh. Well, you haven't seen season three yet, so you really can't answer that question. What do you want to see happen in season three? Well, Gender reassignment. <laughs> I'm going to say uh, for sure, no mercy. And uh, 
No, I've not. I'm not caught up, so I don't. I don't have any specifics. But um, I would say I would. I would go with gender reassignment with uh, with Brian. More more Perfect. crease. More crease is what I oh, that's what I'd like you. to say. Give crease a crease. Give crease a crease. Right. Thanks, Martin. Take care of yourself. It's been a lot of fun. Always uh, a pleasure. All right, let me hit uh, Albert, and then we'll do the uh, news with uh, Dawson sitting in this time. Uh, finance apps lack humanity. Albert combines real human guidance with proven technology so you can stay in control. Amazing, easy-to-use app has uh, three main features. Albert Genius accesses uh, real financial advisors so you can get a so you can message anytime through the app if you like. Albert Savings, which tracks your income and spending. So uh, to find money, you can be saving without disrupting your cash flow. Albert users save an average of 400 bucks in just six months. So if that sounds good, get on it. Albert Instant, it's a cash advance, up to 100 bucks straight to your bank account to uh, tide you over if you need it. No credit check, zero interest, and no late fees. Albert. Right, Dawson? Install Albert from the App Store or Google Play today to find your happy balance and get a bonus of up to $40 when you start an annual subscription to Albert Genius. All right. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back to do the news with Dawson and Bald, and we'll do that right after this. Reporting live from Dudzeldorf, it's the news with Mike Dawson. Yes, live from Dudesdorf. Uh, we touched on this at the beginning of the show, but uh, it's worth talking about again. Eddie Van Halen is dead at 65. The guitarist for Van Halen. The news was broke to the world by his son and uh, Kalen Bean's former schoolmate, Wolfie Van Halen. Mm. Uh, he tweeted, I can't believe I'm having to write this, but my father... Edward Ludwig Van Halen has lost his long and arduous battle with cancer this morning. He was the best father I could ever ask for. Every moment I've shared with him on and off stage was a gift. My heart is broken, and I don't think I'll ever refer, ever fully recover from this loss. I love you so much, Pop. Did um, does uh, when I ever, whenever I think about him, I think of a sort of a a little bit of a tortured soul and maybe a certain amount of waste. I guess I look at everything as sort of potential in life. I I'm very waste oriented. I, I, I don't mind regular folk who have regular jobs and do what they do. But then sometimes I see someone who's amazingly talented Talent, and yeah. gifted and has that background, but yet so much energy seemed to go out to arguing or, you know, like Van Halen in, in any iteration, whether it was um, uh, David or whether it was Sammy, I, I just feel like that they have just gone. They should have just been churning, come, you know, churning out albums and touring and wowing crowds for the last 20 years, like nonstop. And yet, no. Well, Eddie Van Halen's body of work is probably the strongest of, I would say, any guitarist throughout rock and roll. Uh, all of his work, he, they, Van Halen never released anything bad. They never mm -hmm. cut a bad record. Um, but when you talk about you know other artists that maybe we, we, we lost a little too soon, like Stevie Ray Vaughan, you'd be thinking about what would he be doing today? I think the difference between that and Eddie Van Halen is we can look back on Eddie's catalog and say, okay, he did it. Mm, he gave yeah. it all to us. No, I, I agree. I think it's, I feel sad because it makes me feel old because Van Halen was just one of those bands that right. reminded me of being young and they're just always ubiquitous and had all those hits i think uh my favorite i told max a pad a pull it was uh oh now he's got to hit up Kalen, but it's a deep well not a deep cut but uh ain't talking about love it it didn't get the spins that it, it doesn't get the spins now that a lot of van halen hits get but this was just 
an unbridled rock and roll song. Like yeah. it just. Sure. Um, I look ahead. I, we we have a guest calendar for anyone who's listening. And I like to look ahead, see who's coming up, do a little research, uh, see which guests I'm not going to be allowed to talk to. And I saw tomorrow that uh, well, August also makes mistakes like frequently. Like he put uh, Candace Owen on the on the calendar. I was like, well, it's got to be Candace Owens, right. or whatever it was. And I saw tomorrow Patty Smythe is going to be on with an E. And I did a Google search. I'm like. Is that the singer? And Patty Smythe of the knee is a mu uh, muscular therapist, so I can only assume it's the singer who I'm a huge fan of. And I just learned she was offered the lead singer role in Van Halen between David Lee Roth and uh, Sammy Hagar. Hmm. I did not know that. So I did we'll know. Have to bring that up tomorrow. Her first role was in Gentle Ben in 1961. <laughs> that much I know, but we can we will talk to them. All right. Well, anyway, a sad loss. Uh, and I really, I, I never met Eddie Van Halen. I don't think I had a conversation with him. I can tell you, uh, I didn't know much about, I, for a guy who's been in this town for a long time and sort of talked to everybody, I never really spoke to any of the Van Halen brothers. I probably talked to, uh, David Lee Roth, maybe a time or two. Seems like David took over for Howard Stern at the same time. Right. Seems like those two would be volatile together. And then there's, uh, what's the bass player's name? Uh, Michael Anthony. Michael Anthony. Some call him the most fortunate bass player at all of rock and roll. He's, Michael Anthony is easily one of the nicest people I've ever met in my Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Just the friendliest, nice, not nicest rock and roll guys, just one of the nicest guys. So um, th it's interesting that he then got sandwiched in between some of the biggest uh, head cases in the world. And I will say uh, Sammy Hagar is a very nice guy as well. Kind of a kind of a driven businessman, but a very friendly, friendly guy. So anyway, all right, well, he'll be missed. Well, there's lots of music news today. So before we get into right. more serious stuff, uh, ACDC releasing uh, their first single in, in however many years. Uh, it seemed that, remember, when ACDC was on their last tour and they had Axl Rose uh, fill in for the last few shows of their tour. It is seemed Brian that Johnson still in the band? I thought Brian he Johnson is back. It seemed mm. that everybody, the, the band was basically dead. Yeah, drummer Phil Rudd sat out the entire last tour because he was in New Zealand arrested for attempting to procure a murder... Uh, that case ended with uh, him only receiving eight months on house arrest. Uh, singer Brian Johnson missed the last 23 dates uh, because of hearing loss. So he could no longer sing because hearing is an important part of singing. If you can't hear what note you're singing, you can't do it. And then bassist Cliff Williams just said uh, he'd had enough and it was over. But during the last four years, Angus Young and uh, the last members of the uh, Back in Black lineup uh, are back. The new single... Uh, it's called Shot in the Dark. It was released at midnight in New York today. And uh, they're, they're saying that uh, there's some experimental hearing treatment that Brian Johnson was able to undergo. It took several years and lots of microbes or, uh, you know, lots of... Lots Stem of wires in his head. Stuff? No, it's just, it's, it's a piece of machinery that somehow... Mm. But they're not really giving us too much on it. But the funny thing about ACDC is there's an old radio joke that, uh, you know, ACDC is a great band. I love their song. Sounds ACDC. Yeah. Brian Johnson's a big vintage car racing guy. And there was some story that the crazy loud cars did him in in the decibel department because there are painstakingly loud vehicles but i think it's a rock and roll that probably uh probably did him in it's the thing about it but he's a huge vintage car guy which is huge in europe and does a lot of racing and there was a series called like going racing with uh, brian johnson or some version of that i can't think of what it was called but it was a good Kind of thing. He would go out. He would like test drive these cars. He'd take these old multi million dollar Jags and stuff and put them on the track in Europe and and drove in these events. And it was it was an interesting cars that rock. Oh yeah, of course it's got to be called cars that rock. Your show is called Going Racing. Oh, uh, mine is called Going <laughs> Racing, but not with Brian Johnson. No, no. Oh, okay, that's different.
<laughs> yeah, so. cars that rock, of course. But it was good. It was kind of a cool show for uh, for real vintage car guys. It's, it's funny we're talking about this on the day that Eddie Van Halen died because Dawson, I'm sure you're on the same page. Angus Young is a very underrated guitarist. That mm-hmm. guy can fucking rock. He is absolutely. Uh, and another one of those guys who just has that tone that you know Angus is Angus, and he's irreplaceable. Now, if it was uh, Malcolm Young, uh, Angus's brother who played rhythm guitar for ACDC, uh, he passed away after uh, uh, battling dementia for a couple of years. Now, mm. if that was Angus Young who died, ACDC would be done. Mm. ACDC is Angus Young. Well, um, I it's even it's bizarre to think of touring and bands and stadiums and arenas and rock and people on their feet and chicks on shoulders giving wingers and it's it's i I can't even think that way it's like i I, i've been so poisoned by our current climate i'm like well what would a band do these days like they'd have to do some sort of video conference concert or something but at some point we're going to be back out there and people are going to want to see these bands all right. Good final them. final news story for today. Remember the long running case against Led Zeppelin? It's been in the courts for frickin' ever. No, the I didn't know this. Copyright infringement of Stairway to Heaven. Oh, that signed, yeah. Yeah, sued by Randy California from the of band all the songs Spirit. they've stolen. Why that one? Yeah. Um. So yeah. Right. So uh, uh, essentially, the courts ruled uh, back in March that they've never extended copyright protection to just a few notes that a four-note sequence common in the music field is not copyrightable. Well, it's finally over because they tried to get it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court told the estate of Randy California, give it up, bro. It's over. Mm. So They didn't say the word bro, though. That doesn't sound very <laughs> said Supreme bro Court. Yeah. said bro but they, yeah, bro the, the story. Yeah, that's, gotta, it's, that's a weird <laughs> lot in life where you accuse somebody of stealing your song or your intellectual property or whatever that thing is. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but then you spend the next 14 years pursuing it, you know, like at a certain point, who's the joke on like write a song or, or isn't sort of, it's sort of like, well, then if you could write a song or at least you could write the chords to the song, that's one of the biggest songs in rock and roll of all time, then just go out and write another killer song or 10 killer songs, like kind of get on with it. So right. I feel, I feel kind of bad for this dude. Well, on the other hand, is led is led Zeppelin ever coming back in any version? Like, you know, once uh, at a certain point, you know, John Bonham's got a kid, he's a big drummer, right, you know, Jason. so you can, Jason Bonham, you can physically take guys with the same last name and like swap them out sure, in different sure. different they, position. You become like Barry Bonds. They did play one small show about a decade, twenty years ago, maybe with Jason Bonham on drums. Um, but as far as do Page and Plant still perform together? No. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I, uh, Robert Plant is uh, releasing another solo album. Um, it might be out already. I'll have to double check on that. But I think there will, when Bonham died, Led Zeppelin died. All, all the guys said that. And so it's just, it's just wishful thinking, mostly on the part of radio disc jockeys who just miss Led Zeppelin so much that that's anytime that comes back in the news, oh, we might get Led Zeppelin again. No, it's not going to happen. Will we ever have that kind of prolific rock and roll uh, from a band in the sense that now it's uh, it, things are sampled and there's you know DJ this and collaborating with that but will we ever have that band that just cranks out I won't even say hits I'll just say some hits some not hits but just incredible masterpiece songs just one after the other for prolonged periods of time like and if so or or maybe why not? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think like there are bands out there. There's contemporary bands and Foo Fighters sell a lot of tickets and, you know, sell albums and things like that. But is there is there going to be another Led Zeppelin? I think the Foo Fighters probably have the biggest chance to be that. But I don't 
I don't, you know, I really don't think so. I think that the world has changed in so many different ways in the last 30 years that I, I just don't think long, longevity is a part of it anymore. Well, Brian, I mean, still, they're still the Rolling Stones. They're Bri still touring. Brian is a big Beatles fan, of course. Right. Is there, see, the Foo Fighters, well, the, while I like the Foo Fighters, they don't vary like the Beatles vary. They don't have the range that the Beatles had or that Led Zeppelin had. Right. Led Zeppelin and the Beatles had many different hits from like many different genres in a, in a sense. Let me also point out that the Foo Fighters at this point are 25 years old. If they could, if they were going to do it, they would have done it by now. What I'm saying is the Beatles released 10 albums in, ten, in nine years. Mm -hmm. Zeppelin released nine albums in 10 years. You know, right. whatever that, whatever that formula is. Those were prolific bands that were just, were just teeming with uh, creativity. You know, there's so many guys right. in the band could do so many things. And also, like Dawson said, you're so fractured. It's all about Spotify. It's all about singles. It's all about YouTube. Like, I, I just don't see these album-oriented bands being that big, like like a big, big, like the Zeppelin of their day. Well, the format in the 70s especially was you wrote a record, you recorded that record, then you went out and toured that record. While you're out touring that record, you're writing the next record. So mm -hmm. as soon as you get home, you're back in the studio with a new record, then back out on tour, and then you're, while you're on the road, on the bus, you're writing the next record. Right. And so that's that's how bands were able to come out with a new record every single year. They'd tour in the summer, write an album, cut in the winter, right, and then put it out. And that just doesn't happen anymore. The, thus, every third song was about being in a tour bus and <laughs> fucking <laughs> groups exactly. Right. Exactly. when they rolled into a town near you. All right, yeah, let me hit... Uh, life is your inspiration. Let me hit uh, life lock here. Certain behaviors can make you more vulnerable to identity theft, like using the same password on every account, over sharing personal information on social media. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives. Every day, we put our info at risk out there on the internet. You can miss certain threats. You're just monitoring your credit alone. Good thing there is a life lock. Life lock Detects a wide range of identity threats like your social security number for sale on the dark web. Protect yourself, people. If they uh, detect your information is out there, they will send you an alert. It's 2000 and almost 21. Protect your identity with LiveLock, right, Dawson? No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can find out if your information is on the dark web. Get your free dark web scan at LifeLock.com slash scan. Pick the plan that's right for you and save up to 25% off your first year with promo code Adam. That's a free scan at LifeLock.com with slash scan and 25% off with promo code Adam. Wow, I didn't know you did that live. Yeah. Um, Tells it all. The So it's interesting what you and Brian are saying, which is, Maybe there will never be another Led Zeppelin, not because there won't be a talented group of people that come together. It's that formatically it's not going to be conducive. You're not right. going to have you need that rhythm of the f format. And right. that format is not going to force anyone to come out those great albums anymore. And yes. force is the good word. Uh, the, the lifestyle would force mm -hmm. an right. album every year. And Dawson, what, the Zeppelin came out with their Led Zeppelin 1 in 69? Imagine they had come out just 10 years earlier, formed a band. Like, their style of music would not have worked, wouldn't have been played, it wouldn't have been acknowledged. Like, that, that was the era of two and a half minute songs mm -hmm. played on the radio. They, they couldn't do Stairway to Heaven or any of their albums. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we it's needed... all about where you are, when you are, you know, and then, of course, who you are. Yeah. Also, what, what you're ingesting. Like, you needed a lot of pot to listen to a seven minute song versus, you know, uh, Jerry and the dreamers doing this diamond ring doesn't shine for me anymore. And this, that was like also pop, 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 pop. Back then it just didn't work. And then you usher in this sort of pot kind of, kind of fueled vibe. And if you think about, if you think about it, like, that stuff was, you're just made to get stoned and listen to yep. a seven minute song, which just didn't work with ditties. Yes. And you can thank the Beatles for that because they were the biggest band. They're like, fuck that. We're doing the White Album. We're doing double albums full of fucking experimental beeps and boops. Right. And they drove the industry. And the, uh, the, um, music business during the Beatles was all on singles. It was actually Led Zeppelin who changed that. Their manager, Peter Grant, was like, we're not doing singles. 
Mm. You want you want the you want it by the album. By the way, I think uh, Gary Lewis and the Playboys, who was Jerry Lewis's son, sung really? this diamond ring. Yeah, Gary Lewis and the Playboys had a oh, couple yeah. of hits. This diamond ring was probably one of them, and maybe one other hit. And that was Jerry Lewis's kid. I bet they had a wonderful oh, sure. relationship as adults. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and that was he. They had a couple of top ten hits or top. I don't know if they had some couple of number ones like this yeah. diamond ring and diamond stuff. Diamond ring, count me in. Count me in. <laughs> oh, me. if you you got count me in. If you if you want to hear the antithesis, the the polar opposite of a Led Zeppelin song that came just four years later, basically in terms of time, maybe five years later in time, greatest. The, uh, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones all came right on right the heels yeah. of that. And that was an obscure song. That was that was number two in America, wow. everyone. All wow. right, let me hit uh, Madison Reed, mister, and then we'll bring it on home with uh, Dawson over here. Working from home. Hmm, look, got to uh, spend a little too much time with the gray and the beard and the gray on the temples. Madison Reed, mister. Gray blending, natural color for your hair and beard. Uh, you got to see the before and after shots. Just hop on their uh, website, Madison Reed, Mister. Uh, no shoe polish look. I can tell you that right now. <clears throat> Want a little more pepper and a little less salt? Madison Reed, Mister, makes it easy to uh, get the color match. Lynette loves this stuff. The Madison Reed. I love the Madison Reed, Mister. It's easy. Just run it through your fingers. Pick out the right shade. Up and done in about ten minutes. Rinse it out and uh, look newer. A newer you. It's Madison Reed Mister, right, Dawson? Go to MadisonReedMister.com. That's M-A-D-I-S-O-N-R-E-E-D-M-R.com. And use code Corolla for 10% off plus free shipping on your first box. Again, that's code Corolla. All right. Nice job, Dawson. Thank you, boss. And Brian. Oh, and- one more. One more oh, one tiny more. bit of news. Mm. Oh. Keith Richards still alive. Just... Just want to put it out there. Is that Mike August said that? <laughs> we'll uh, we'll bring it home, and then uh, we'll bring in uh, Chuck Liddell and Jeff Cesaro, and we'll do the sports. Bring it home. You got it. Don't worry, Gina. Your job is safe. That was the news with Mike Dawson. All right, adios, guys. I'll be back to talk to uh, Chuck, the Ice Man Liddell, and uh, Jeff Cesario right after this.